Assalamu alaikum. Are you looking for a reliable source to learn more about Islam? Look no further. Our app, One Islam TV, is the perfect solution for you. Get access to a wide range of informative and engaging content in Islam right at your fingertips. Download our app now and start your free trial. And when you come into Jannah, the angels are, are the ones who greet you. You know when you come to the hotel in this place, you get the serviceman, he's greeting you. Yeah? Your serviceman, first serviceman inside Jannah are the angels. And they say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To you and to all your family members. All of you. Don't worry, they won't have this American accent. Yeah? But what they will have is they will have the language of Arabic. Everyone in Jannah will automatically speak Arabic. Everyone in Jannah, Rasulullah said automatically in Jannah, when you get inside the Hadith of Bukhari, you will be like your father Adam alayhi salam, 60 foot tall, 60 foot tall, 7 foot wide. Everyone will be the size of Adam alayhi salam. Everyone will have the voice of Dawood alayhi salam. Because when Dawood used to sing the Psalms, Allah revealed to him, he used to sing it. And he had, a, he had the most beautiful voice any human being ever had. And Allah said in the Holy Quran, Allah said in the Holy Quran in Surah to Saad, that when he used to sing, At-Tayra Mahshura, the birds used to come in their hundreds, in lines, in rows, and they used to sit right around him, and they used to all sing along with him. Even Allah said, Al-Jibal, the mountains would sing with him. If you heard his voice, your heart would melt. You now some people have voices, subhanAllah, he had the best of the voice. So every person of Jannah will have that voice. Every person in Jannah will get the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam. SubhanAllah, but don't worry, there won't be any, um, you know, other kind of people in Jannah. Only men, men to women and women to men, alright? There's no uh, you know, other business, alright? Yusuf salam was the most handsome individual. The women cut their hands, they were... <laughs> blood pouring down. Even if you cut your hand, you know how painful it is? They cut it right from between the thumb and the, and the uh, forefinger. They cut it. There's a cut in the apple, they went straight through, through the skin, into the meat right towards the bone and they're still going that's you in Jannah brother so you come inside and the angels greet you and you get this the husn of Yusuf and the, from your heart all that hatred is taken out and the fourth thing Rasulullah said every person gets what is what you get the character of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah so you're not gonna hurt anyone in Jannah don't worry if you basically you know Accidentally do something. There's no accidents in Jannah, but I'm just saying if there is, don't worry. There's no hospitals. So if you work as a doctor, you don't get no job in Jannah. Don't worry. You know what I'm saying? There's no lawyers in Jannah. There's no there's no arguments in Jannah. So if you're a lawyer, so there's nothing. No engineers. You don't have to build Jannah. It's all built for you, right? <laughs> nothing goes wrong in Jannah. Subhanahu wa Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Sahih Hadith of Muslim, you do not even have anything coming out of your nose in Jannah. You know, you get a cold and <laughs> nothing. You got, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you got basically blow your nose out clean. No, none of that, none of that. There's no bad air in Jannah. There's no bad dust in Jannah. Jannah is perfect. The Surah to Dahar says that it never, لا يرون فيها شمسا ولا زمحريرا. You will never see the sun in Jannah. There's been natural light. You'll never have a cold day in Jannah. There's no cold, there's no hot. You know when sometimes you feel that, you know on some days you come out and you feel, wow, that, oh, that is nice, man. The wind is blowing just the right amount and the sun is, you know, on your face just the right amount. You know that kind of day? That's every day in Jannah. Every day in Jannah. It never gets, and it gets better. It always gets better. So you can imagine you've come inside here, there's nothing, you know, there, no one will spit in Jannah. You know, some guys, I can't stand them in this world when they, every, every time, they, yeah, bro, we're talking about. <laughs> they think it's Mr. Bad Man, you know. It's horrible, it's horrible. What are you doing that for? I mean, come on, in the, in the Sunnah, Rasulullah said what? He said, even in masjid, if you see someone's, you know, something come out of their mouth, or the nose, you see it, you better clean it because, subhanAllah, what did Prophet say? 
He said, Allah has is a hadith in Bukhari. He said, Allah presented to me the actions that the best of actions and the worst of actions. From the best of act, from, from the best of actions I saw, a man who will remove a harmful item from the pathway. That's the best of actions. From the worst of actions is there's a bit of phlegm or there's a bit of the part from the nose, okay? Mucus inside the masjid and people see it and they don't want to they don't want to clean it that's from the worst of actions so no one's going to spit in jannah no one there's no toilets in jannah Woohoo! you can go you can enjoy yourself don't have to worry about the toilet you can drink you know when, you, when they drink alcohol there's a problem of letting it all out right <laughs> there's none of that problem they can you can drink and drink no one will go to the toilet in Jannas and no one and then that word the Sahaba the Sahaba said Messenger of Allah what yeah, you drink you eat all of that you know you got the power of a hundred men to eat <laughs> you know what I'm saying now some people you sit with them in this world you think you know go and take it easy man you know <laughs> before you you got five chickens before you take one in he's taking four right <laughs> go on, man take it easy now there's some people like that now don't worry in Jannah you got plenty of food yeah you know the food in Jannah is so much Laila so much you can sit there all day and eat you can eat. Now he got the word, the Sahaba, they're worried. What's going to happen? So Prophet said, don't worry, you just sweat. 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 But what the sweat is, Rasulullah said, your sweat will smell of musk. So when you sweat, it's really nice because you've got nice new perfume on yourself. So she's even dying to come closer to you because you sweat. You sweat inside Jannah. In Jannah, you have your labinatum min dhahab, labinatum min fiddha. You have certain houses made of pure gold. There are certain places of Jannah made of pure gold. Certain places made of pure, pure silver. Certain places pure diamonds, pure rubies. And certain places Allah mixes them up. One brick is gold, one brick silver, one brick emerald, one brick diamond, one brick sapphire, one brick something else. Each one is different. The door of one of the palaces that you've got in Jannah is so big, it's from the earth here to our sky. <coughs> and you walk inside. When you walk inside, you've got one room that leads to another room, that leads to another room, that leads to another room, and each one, so the, the, you can imagine the size of these. Each room has got 70 tables of food. Each table has got 70 variety, 70 different plates of food. Each plate has got certain dishes and each time they take a fruit, you know what will happen? They take a fruit and you know, you get, sometimes you get a bit spoiled, right? People of Jannah, they get a bit spoiled. They eat one fruit and they say, okay, thanks, I've stated it. They give them a fruit and it looks exactly the same. They say, hey, hey, it's to the servant. You can have loads of servants, loads of servants. Really nice looking good young servants, all right? But you can't do anything with them, you know what I mean? They will serve you. Allah said, Gilman, Gilman, the young boys that will serve you. Right? And they will serve you and they will give you dish after dish. The one giving you one, and the next one gives you another one. They're your servants in Jannah. You tell them whatever to do, they'll do it. And they give you one fruit that is similar to another fruit. Wa utubihi mutashabiha. They're given the same fruit. And say, hey, listen, what are you giving the same fruit? I'm just tasting this one, well, give me another one. They say, no, 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 taste it. When they tasted, the same fruit tasted different. The same fruit tastes different. And some fruit you taste them, each bite you taste, they're always different. Each bite you have is different. So you eat. Allah says what? Lahmi tayri mimma yashtahun. In a hadith of Tirmidhi, a person sees in Jannah, he's sitting down, he's lying down, and he sees a nice bird flying over. The real bird, right? Not that other bird, right? <laughs> the real bird. Flying over. So he sees and he wishes that he could have, you know, he remembers in the world he used to love chicken and chips, right? You know, chicken and chips? I'm not saying the hadith says chicken and chips, right? But I'm just saying like he probably wants that roasted right in front of me, grilled, barbecued, whatever, yeah? So he wants that. He just has his desire and that bird from the air drops right in front of him, roasted, ready, barbecued, grilled, and he just bunches it. Throws the bones away, and when he throws the bones away, that bones become another bird, the same bird, and it flies away. I can imagine some of you just looking back and going, all right, get back here. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> he was too nice. 
Come back here. In Jannah, they, they have, according to Hadith of Tirmidhi, you have marketplaces. And these marketplaces, when they go there, the marketplaces have designer faces. You don't have no plastic surgery in Jannah, brother, sister, cosmetic, this, that. You go, you have these designer faces. These are real people inside Jannah who've got beautiful faces. And they're all in different places of the market. And you just look at them. You just desire that your face looks like that and your face changes. Your face changes. But you might get worried now, right? When I go back to my wives, they're not going <laughs> to recognize me. <laughs> they go come back home and their wives come running out to them. And they say, you look even more beautiful than what you went with the face you went with. You look even more beautiful. They will have 70 pieces of clothes on them. Thin pieces, fabrics on them. Each one is a very delicate fabric on the on the hurain. The hawra. 70. And through the 70, according to Hadith Muslim, through the 70 of these beautiful fabrics on her, he sees the love she has for him pumping in her marrow bone. Forget the heart, it's in her marrow bone. Allah has created her to see nothing more than just you. Me, you. <laughs> because you, Allah will make her be... In fact, right now, you know, you're in, you're, you're in this, uh, this world right now. You know, the hadith says, Prophet said, you know, when a, when a person's wife says th things to him, bad things, are oh, you this, you that, you never tidy up, you do our, you know, you get it from your wife. Yes, guys, nod your heads. Say yes. yes. Or is he only my wife? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, she's a good person. Yeah, she's a good person. Okay. She'll be listening to this one day, you know what I'm saying? She'll be getting me back at this. But I say this to, me, to her home as well. She says bad things, whatever. Oh, she, one of your wives said it, you know, Rasulullah said, he says, your hurain in Jannah are saying, Are you? Are you? Stop saying that. He's our husband as well. Our husband as well. He's in a hadith. So sometimes I tease my wife and I tell her this. I say, listen, hey, listen take it easy, take it easy. My wife's in Jannah saying something. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's in Jannah not liking you. They're not liking you. Don't say that. And she starts laughing. Right? Just to make her laugh. Yeah, I really wind her up sometimes. I just make her laugh. Because when she gets mad at me, I just wind her up. So, you know, the, the, the women, okay, they're probably thinking, SubhanAllah, what are they going to get? They are going to become the most beautiful out of all your wives in Jannah. I didn't hear SubhanAllah from you guys. my brothers and sisters I want you to think about paradise because this is what drives us in paradise my brothers and my sisters time will no longer exist Allah says in Jannah fiha abada. in Jannah my brother and my sister you will live therein forever yani not a hundred years not a thousand years not 10,000 years, not a hundred, you will live therein forever. You will never, ever, ever die. Can you imagine that? You will never die. Some of the scholars, they try to give an analogy to help you understand. And they said, imagine, right? Can you imagine this hall now? Imagine we filled up this hall with sand. How many grains of sand do you reckon will be in here? 
خلاص it's a figure that you can't count yeah surely the scholar said imagine we filled up the whole earth we filled it up with sand really the the um, they actually used mustard seed right but yani they said imagine we filled up the whole earth with mustard seed from the ground all the way to the skies and every one billion years one bird would come to earth take one mustard seed and go and it won't come back for another billion years it will come back after a billion years take one seed and go the scholars say this bird will use up all of these mustard seeds all the mustard seeds would finish and you will still be in jannah khalidina fiha abada you will be there forever my brother and my sister no fear of death in jannah you will never grow old did you know that an old lady she came to the prophet of allah and she says our oh, prophet of allah is there room in jannah for an old lady like me he says to her no in jannah there are no old ladies so she began to cry so he smiled at her sallallahu alaihi wasallam with that smile that penetrates the heart and he says to her in jannah Allah will take you back to your youthful days and you will live forever in Jannah as a youth. In Jannah, my brothers and sisters, you will be the age of about 33 years old. Can you imagine you and your father are the exact same age? You and your mother will be the exact same age. And in Jannah, you will be as tall as your father, Adam. About 30 meters high. In Jannah, my brothers and sisters, you will never have to go to the toilet ever again. Imagine that. You never ever have to do number one or number two or number three. Some people do number three. I don't know what that one is. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, there's only one and two. In Jannah, you will never go to the toilet again. My sisters in paradise, you will never have your monthlies ever again. You will never have these emotions and everything that comes along with it, my sister. Never done, finished, dusted. In Jannah, you will never get sick. In Jannah, you will never get tired. In Jannah, you will never sleep. You don't sleep in Jannah. In Jannah, my brothers, you will never get old. You will never get tired. You will never feel fatigued. It's just pure and pure and pure happiness for eternity, forever. This is the prize that Allah has prepared. In Jannah, there's no more fasting. In Jannah, there's no more Salah. In Jannah, there's no more Wudu. In Jannah, there's no more worship. Nothing. You never have to do anything ever again. In Jannah, you will be clean shaven. No more this. You see this? This won't be there in paradise. I can't wait, man. <laughs> well, I can't wait. Uh, look, really, wallahi, it's the sunnah and wallahi, I love the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Wallahi, it's the sunnah and it's here. But if I had the choice, I will rip it off as soon as I can. <laughs> you know, I'm an electrician by trade. So as an electrician, I use the cordless drill a lot. And sometimes I'll be doing a delicate job and, and I have to sort of focus and get close. So many times, you know, I'll be focusing, getting close as I'm using the drill and, and my bead gets caught in the drill. All right? 
in Jannah no more. And in Jannah, my brothers and sisters, imagine, maybe the boys, they won't appreciate this as much, but the sisters. In Jannah, the Prophet of Allah, he tells us that you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to be the most amazing creation that ever walked the earth. Wallahi, in this dunya, grab the most beautiful woman on the face of the planet. The most breathtaking woman. And tell her, look, if you can change a couple of features within yourself, what would you change? Wallahi, she'll give you a whole list of things. But in Jannah, my brothers and my sisters, you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to go, God damn, man. <laughs> Who is that, man? <laughs> Woo! Hey! <laughs> Perfect in every way. Sisters are really struggling. What does he mean? You won't change anything. Perfect in every way. This is Jannah. And in Jannah, nothing will ever get old with you. You see, in dunya, everything gets old. In dunya, everything is beautiful to begin with, but then it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And I'll give you an example. Maybe the younger guys, they're not going to know what I'm on about, but maybe those that are a little bit older will catch on. Do you guys remember when the Atari came out? Does anyone know what the Atari is? Sega? Nintendo? The young guys are thinking, who's this dinosaur, man? What are you going to talk about? Does anyone remember the Nintendo? You remember the first one? You know, the, whack, whack. you know the one that duck hunt? Yeah? When that thing came out, I was a very young, young, young. When that thing came out, Ya Allah, that was the peak of happiness. That was it. If you had that, that's Jannah on earth. There isn't any more purpose to life than Nintendo. So when we were young, I couldn't afford it. And it was expensive, you know, and my mom and dad were doing it, you know. So I would beg, mom, dad, you don't understand. Wallahi, this is it. This is the peak of happiness. This is the reason. This is the purpose of my existence. The Nintendo, man, you got to get me the Nintendo. Anyway, so because it took them so long to save up the money and buy it for me, Eventually, when they did buy it, Allahu Akbar, the joy and the happiness in my heart, man. You know how long the joy lasted for? Until the Super Nintendo came out. And because it took them so long to buy it, it there was a very small gap between the Nintendo and the Super. Wallahi, and what was the purpose of my happiness became the purpose of my misery and destruction. Come on, man. I can't play duck hunt while the brothers are playing Mario Kart. Come on, man. Wallahi, and I spent my life like this. Eventually, when my mom bought me the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo 64 came out. When the Nintendo 64, and this is dunya. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Everyone will go paradise. More good news. That's good news, isn't it? Well, I, you know, I thought, you know, that's great. That's it. You know, I didn't read the second part. <laughs> I only read the first part. Fantastic. Oof, things are better. Then I read the second part. The second part says, except for those of you who don't want to go paradise. So the companions asked, who doesn't want to go to paradise? Said, those who don't want to obey or believe. Those who don't want to follow or believe. The hellfire is such a warning that Allah describes this in Surah Qaf. He says, for those who go to hellfire, you know this God is such a merciful God. He forgives anything and everything, even blasphemy. If you were to repent, if you were to just repent, but if you don't and you go into hell, subhanAllah, what a horrible thing. That ending is seriously a horrible place to enter because if you end up in hell, it means you skipped every possible opportunity. And there was nothing but evil in here. And that I hope is no one we know, none of us, hopefully no one 
but it's up to the individuals who want to go there. So Allah says out of anger, because He loves us 70 times or more than even our own mother. He says, you preferred hell over being with me? I wanted paradise for you. Iblis came to Allah the moment he committed kufr. His life was finished. He was damned to hell. And Iblis, Satan said to God, he says, what is atika ya Rab? First he said, oh Allah, let me live. Just give me time till the day of judgment. Let me live with them. Let's test these people you've chosen over me. And so Allah answered his dua and said, okay. You have this. So he said, by your, by your honor, O oh Allah, I swear that I will mislead them so long as their soul remains in their body. Meaning I will tempt them towards wrong. And Allah said, and by my honor and my glory, I swear, so long as they keep coming back to me, I will forgive them. Do what you want. That's what he said to Satan. With that much mercy, he says to the man, you preferred hell. You chose not to say, I'm sorry. You just did not want to make Tawbah for anything? You thought you created yourself? You thought the future was just for you? So then he says, out of anger, then have hell upon hell, upon hell, upon hell. Meaning, why did you pick that? That's not that God wants to punish. He wants to punish no one. God is angry that you ended up there. Why did you choose to go there? Why didn't you want to come and be with me? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters of Quran Weekly. There's a very powerful hadith I wanted to share with you. It's narrated by Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ narrates to us an interesting conversation. It's a conversation between Musa alayhi salam and his Lord. And Musa alayhi salam, Rasulullah says, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the lowest person in Jannah? Right? Who is the lowest person that's going to enter into Jannah? What's the lowest manzila? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him that it would be a person that would come after everyone else has entered into Jannah. And it would be said to him, enter and take your portion of it. And the man would say, Ya Allah, how can I take my portion when everyone else has already taken their portion? So there's, he would think that there's nothing left in Jannah because everyone else has already settled into Jannah. Now this isn't, we, we might know the other hadith where which Rasulullah talks about the last person to enter Jannah, so it's obviously the same person. So he wouldn't know where to go because he'd think that everything was already taken in Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, Ya Abdi, atarda an yakuna lak mulki malikin min muluk dunya Oh my servant, would you be pleased that you have the kingdom of, you know, the, uh, the kingdom of the world uh, that the greatest king in this world would have? And the man responds, Radit, qala na'am, yes, I'm pleased with that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَكَ ذَلِكْ وَمِثْلُ 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 حَتَّى بَلَغَ خَمْسَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so you have that. And, and, and then another one like it, and another one like it, and another one like it, another one like it, and another one like it, until he reached five times. And the man says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Radit, I'm pleased. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Falaka kullu dhalik. So you have all of that. Wa ashru amthalu. And you will have 10 times that. So 50 times the kingdom of the world is what goes to the lowest person in Al Jannah. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa alayhi salam this and Musa alayhi salam is thinking to himself, well, if that's what the lowest person in Jannah gets, he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَمَا بَالُ أَعْلَاهَا So what about someone who's higher than that? Like I'm a prophet of Allah, I'm going to be in the sixth heaven. So what is it like for someone who's higher than that? And you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to Musa alayhi salam? He says, لا تسأل Don't ask. <laughs> Don't ask. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمْ تَرَى عَيْنِ Because no eye has seen it. وَلَمْ تَسْمَعْ أُذُنْ And no ear has heard it. وَلَمْ يَخْطُرْ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرًا It's never even come to the wildest imagination of a person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ The ayah in Surah Al-Sajdah that no one knows what Allah, no eye can grasp what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for the believer as a reward for that which they used to do. Why do I bring up this very powerful hadith in Sahih Muslim? A lot of times when we think about Jannah, when we talk about Jannah, and we read some of the hadith about Jannah, it sounds a little strange, doesn't it? You know, the first meal in Jannah is going to be fish liver, 
Uh, and so that would make Bengalis very happy, no, no pun intended. Uh, you know, uh, that you're gonna have trees that grow clothes, you know, you're gonna have houses that are made of gold and, you know, musk is what's keeping the bricks together and so on and so forth. You read this stuff and it's like, wow, okay, this is really strange. And, you know, I don't even like fish liver, you know, because I'm not Bengali. Or it could be that, you know what, I'm reading about Hur al Ain and, you know, that sounds really uh, inappropriate to me, this Hur al Ain thing, this whole Hur al Ain thing. So let's just say that it means grapes. Wait a minute, but Rasulullah is telling us that it's a different place, okay? We're not talking about, you know, something that we would see in dunya or something that even makes sense to dunya because when Rasulullah described the women of paradise, Rasulullah said that they would be transparent, you could see their bone marrow. Now, would you be attracted to a woman if you could see her bone marrow in dunya? No, it's a totally different realm, it's a totally different world. Or someone says, you know, why do I have to be with my husband in paradise? Why do I have to be with my wife in paradise? You know, I don't want to see them anymore, I'm sick of them, I had to live all of dunya with them. It's different. In Jannah, people are different. In Jannah, there is no uh, jealousy. In Jannah, there is no hatred. In Jannah, there is no dissatisfaction because the one who created desire is giving you all that you could possibly desire. And in Jannah, you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, akhiratu khayrun wa And the Akhirah is better and, and everlasting, right? Because in dunya, you get something and even if it's great, you know, it's not going to last. Eventually it's going to, you know, eventually it's going to reach its expiration or you'll get sick of it. One of the two things is bound to happen. But in Jannah, Rasulullah describes that every time the wife will see the husband and the husband will see the wife again, they would say to each other, you're even more beautiful than the last time I left you. Right? Now, so, you, so with that being said, then what's the point of even reading a hadith about Jannah? And is Jannah really going to be satisfying to me? Is it going to be too weird for me to really enjoy? And this is the beauty of it. As different as Jannah is, <clears throat> it's not that weird. And in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the things that are familiar to us when it benefits us and when it makes us happy. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ said that whenever a person enters into a Jannah, they would go to their homes in Jannah easier than they would go to their homes in dunya. You know, when you're driving home from work, you're not thinking, you're, you know, hopefully you're not pulling out your GPS, uh, you know, looking at how to get home or looking up Google Maps. You're used to driving home. You drive home subconsciously. You could be talking on the phone, eating cereal, driving with your foot, whatever, how crazy you are. But you're going to make it home at the end of the day because you, you're so used to driving home. Rasulullah said that a person would go to his home and he, would, and he would know the way to his home more than he knew the way to his home in dunya. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us something very beautiful in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُلَّمَا رُزِقُوا مِنْهَا مِنْ ثَمَرَةِ الرِّزْقًا قَالُوا هَذَا الَّذِي رُزِقْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ Every time you're given something in Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you some sustenance in Jannah, some risk in Jannah. You say, oh, this is what we had before. Meaning what? You see a mango in Jannah, you see an orange in Jannah, you see a banana in Jannah, you see an apple in Jannah. Uh, and, and Imam Malik rahimahullah, he said that the banana, he used to eat bananas because he said bananas are most like the fruits in Jannah because they're not seasonal. Uh, he used to love eating bananas, Imam Malik rahimahullah. And so you see these fruits and you see this risk and you see some things that, that resemble what they resembled in dunya. But then you take a bite of and then, you know, you see what it, you, it seems to be the same thing, but once you are, once you take a bite of it, this is not the same, right? This is totally different. You know, this, this does not taste the way that it tasted in dunya. You know, this doesn't have a sour aftertaste. This is, this is totally different. So Allah gives you enough to be familiar with and at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that level of excitement. Allah gives you the element of surprise and subhanAllah, there is one thing in Jannah which no human being could experience in dunya and that is an-nadharu ila wajhihi al-kareem subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to stare at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to actually see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً for those who performed with excellence, they will have excellence returned to them and more. And the Sahaba understood. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we know what husna is here. It's talking about Jannah. Jannah for your excellence, husna for ihsan. But what is more than Jannah? And that's when the Prophet ﷺ told them, Anadaru ila wajhillah. Right? Because that's something that you could never experience in dunya, that no human being could experience in dunya. That's something that is beyond our imagination, that is beyond pleasure. 
and we would have that pleasure bi ta'ala in Jannah. The, the reason why I, I make this video, dear brothers and sisters, and the reason why I bring this up is because again, a lot of times we try to dunyify Jannah. And we get caught up, you know, we try to see Jannah through our worldly lens, right? We try to understand Jannah with the scope of dunya. And that's a big problem, right? Don't worry about the details of Jannah. And don't worry about the trees that are growing clothes. And don't worry about who you're going to be with in Jannah. Just know that you're going to be happy. So the point is, try to make it there. Do everything that you can to make it there. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the authentic hadith that we mentioned in the previous video. If you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, man thalath marrat, whoever asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah three times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will allow Jannah to make dua to Allah to say, Oh Allah, enter him into me. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enter us into Jannah al Firdaus. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enter us into Jannah al Firdaus. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enter us into Jannah al Firdaus. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. I hope to see you all either in dunya or in Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We need to make sure whatever we have, you see we are seated here, I'm sure there are so many people who are listening to us online as well. And there will be others who will listen to this later again. May Allah bless us all, really. May Allah grant us all Jannah. We all want it. Jannah is not something that I can say, okay guys, you know what, if I'm going there, I'm going to make sure you're not there. That's not how it works. Because in this dunya, we have, you know, we have a power struggle in the world. When it comes to paradise, you make a dua for others to earn paradise. The angels make that dua for you. You ask Allah to grant the others paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant that to you as a result of your prayer for others. May Allah make us people who are generous. You know, this world, sometimes people have small problems. And because of the problem, you say, you know, this, this person has really troubled me. I just wish they're not in Jannah. What guarantee do you have you going to be in Jannah? What if they are making a dua to say, oh Allah, this person has hassled me a lot. Let us get to Jannah because I know that in Jannah they won't hassle. Wow, what a nice way of looking at it. Same applies to spouses. You know, there is a huge debate. It's a storm in a teacup. What's the storm in the teacup? People say, well, I have the same spouse I have here in heaven. And they spoil their face. You know, when they ask you, well, I have my spouse in heaven. You know that it means something good. And when they say, well, I have the same man that I had here for 30 years. Well, I have him there as well. You know, there was something wrong. It's the expression on the face that gives it away. And you got to look at them and you got to say, Yes, you know, and then they look at you and say, what? what? Can't I have someone else? Well, what if I told you that he'll be the top shot, best person available there completely? What are you going to say? I can't believe that, man. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So I always say, because people debate, okay, so men will have this. What will women have? And women will have that. So what will men have? Hang on. We're losing focus. Understand? The main aim is to get there. After that, Allah says, فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِيهِ الْأَنفُسُ وَتَلَذُّ الْأَعْيُنْ وَأَنْتُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Speaking of Jannah, Allah says, in it, whatever a, a soul desires, that soul shall have. What you desire, you will have. So I cannot desire now and decide, hey, when I go to Jannah, I'm not going to want this man and I'm not going to want this woman. I'm going to want the other lady who's down the road there. You cannot decide here and now because you first need to get to Jannah. You need to have the mind that will be given to you complete, that will be in Jannah, of Jannah, of the people of the Akhirah. We cannot describe beyond what Allah has told us. But what we do know is when that happens and then you choose something, here's the verse of the Quran, you can hold it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear that you can you can hold Allah to his promise subhanallah if Allah has promised you something you can hold him to that promise you can say ya Allah I worked and I worked so hard here was your promise in the Quran ya Allah give you won't even need to say that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not such that he will go against what he's promised you in Allah you know Allah will not go against that appointed whatever he has promised or appointed in any way, no ways, not at all. So people start asking, you know, what will I have? Remember, in the process of the discussion of what you are going to actually have, a lot of the times we lose focus of actually getting there. That's the thing. 
So what's the point of a person who's not dressed appropriately? They're not reading salah. They're not, and they say, you know what? If I'm, if that's what I'm, if that's what I'm going to get in Jannah, then I don't even want to waste my time preparing for it. That is the devil. He's got hold of you because when you get there, you will never be let down. Subhanallah. I was reading just before I came. In fact, I was on the metro a few moments ago and I was reading a book that I had it with me. And there's a hadith, subhanallah, amazing. It's good to refresh your mind all the time. And speaking of the last person who will enter Jannah, the last person. And amazingly, amazingly, it says the person will be given not just equivalent to the entire dunya and what it had, but that 10 times. 10 times. Imagine today, take a look at what the dunya has. And to be honest with you, this is only a description to bring it close to the mind because nothing that we've got in this world qualifies to come to the akhirah. Not the beautiful perfumes, not the technology completely. No WhatsApp in paradise. Remember this. No, not at all. No, anything you've thought of, any phones and iPhones and whatever, no ways. So if someone says, I'm not going to have my games in heaven. Ooh, what's, what am I going to do there? I'll be bored. You haven't thought. You haven't even thought for a minute. You know, we are being occupied with so many things here. It's not going to come. Imagine everything of value in this world, if it was yours and yours alone, and you were the boss and the king of, of whatever was there, every single thing, whether it, no matter what it is, imagine it was yours. And the hadith says, multiply that by 10 and convert it to that which is in heaven. So it's not the cheap stuff of, the, of this world. You put a battery in your phone, the battery goes. You use the phone for a while, it stops functioning. Something happens, you know, you start wilting. Jannah is not like that. You don't wilt. You are at a beautiful age. It's reported that the age of 33, a certain height, beauty, beauty. You look how you want to look, subhanallah. How do you want to look? Mashallah, you look like that. Now what do you want? That's the afterlife. What's the point of talking about all this when we haven't even prepared for it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us really. And this is why it's important for us to know that reading about heaven and hell should mainly make us focus upon achieving heaven and staying away from hell. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the people of hellfire? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is the life after. وَنَادَى أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ أَنْ أَفِيضُوا عَلَيْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ أَوْ مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَهُمَا عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ لَهُوَ وَلَعِبَا وَغَرَّتْهُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فَالْيَوْمَ نَنْسَاهُمْ كَمَا نَسُوا لِقَاءَ يَوْمِهِمْ هَذَا وَمَا كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَجْحَدُونَ On that day, the people of hellfire will call out to the people of heaven, asking them to pour on them some water or liquid, anything that Allah has bestowed you with, pour it on us. We are struggling, we are suffering, we are being burnt, we are struggling in such a way that this heat is immense and intense. Pour on us something that Allah has given you. And the people of Jannah will say, that's one thing we are not allowed to do. Allah has prohibited that against those who disbelieve, they belie. You knew what was right, you turned away. And Allah says, on this day, nansahum, we will forget them in the same way that they forgot us. Where did they forget us? When they were in the world, we sent them messages. We sent them messengers. We sent them reminders. We, we made sure that we created them in a way that they knew that they're going to leave the world, but they didn't prepare for the day they left. Subhanallah. Today, let's be honest. A lot of us here are expatriates. Why are we in Dubai? Have you ever asked yourself the question? People might say, well, you know, I've been here because we need to do business and I need to earn. I've got a job. Beautiful place. Mashallah. Nice to earn and so many things that are good that are happening. But why are we here? Because we want a certain quality of life. Subhanallah. If we were able to achieve a better quality of life elsewhere, perhaps we wouldn't be here. But mashallah, it's so good that if, if that is your concern, for as long as it's within the limits of what Allah has prescribed, Alhamdulillah, you're doing a good thing. But don't forget, don't forget at all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept something permanent and that is Jannah. 
do not lose focus upon Jannah, even for a specific, even for a split moment. Because if that's the case, Wallahi, we stand to lose, no matter what we've achieved here, temporary. That's the word. Jannah, the Prophet of Allah, he tells us that you'll pick up a fruit. You don't even pick it. You see a fruit in paradise and you just have to wish it. You just have to desire it and that fruit will come to you. Then you take a bite. The Prophet of Allah tells us it will be the most amazing thing you ever tasted in your life. Then the next bite from the same fruit will be better than the first. And for eternity in Jannah, you will never ever taste that first bite ever again. It will only get better and better and better for eternity. When you see your wife, sorry sisters man, but I got to tell the brothers the truth, you know. When you see your wife in Jannah for the first time, it is said you will be lost in awe for 40 years. So you're going to go, what? For 40 years. Then when you look away, and look at her again she's gonna be more beautiful than when you first looked at her and today the most beautiful girl in this world you look at her for four minutes you say bro is her line is her nose out of line yeah over there it only gets better over there she only gets better and your wife so your wife of dunya if she's there with you, you know, people ask me, bro, is my wife going to be there in Jannah? I'm thinking, cuz really, do you really want her there, bro? Isn't it enough? You had her here, you want her there as well. But if she's there with you, the Prophet of Allah tells us that your wife's beauty compared to the beauty of Hur al Ain is like the light of a candle compared to the light of the sun. Uncomparable. All this Allah has prepared for you. Houses. Not houses. The Prophet of Allah, he tells us your tent. Do you, do you guys have tents? Do you know what a tent is? Yeah? Khaymah. Your tent, you know, when you go camping. The Prophet of Allah tells us your tent in Jannah. Not your house. Your tent in Jannah will be carved out of one single pearl. The height of which is 60 miles high and 60 miles wide. This is your tent. Your palaces in Jannah, their bricks will be made of gold and silver. The mortar that brings the bricks together will be made of musk. All this is for you in Jannah. All this is for those who are holding on, for those who are patient for that little bit in this world. All this Allah has prepared as a reward for you. But you know what's the most amazing thing in paradise? Is in Jannah, Allah will collect us all together, inshaAllah, in Jannah. And Allah will speak to us. Imagine. Authentic hadith. I want you to really, honestly, my brothers, I really want you to imagine this. All jokes aside now. In Jannah, Allah Azza wa He will gather us all and He will speak to us. And Allah will say to you, my brother and my sister, is there anything more that you want? Is there anything I can do for you? Imagine Allah speaking to you like this. Imagine Allah says to you, is there anything more that I can do for you? So we will say, oh Allah, you saved us from hellfire. 
you entered us into the paradise. You have allowed us to live forever and ever in your Jannah. You have given us all of these luxuries. Oh Allah, what more could we possibly ask for? So Allah will say, so are you content? We will say, oh Allah, we are so content. There is nothing more we can possibly ask for. Allah will say, then if that is the case, as of this day forward, I promise you that from this day forward, I will never ever be displeased with you ever again. Imagine this, my brothers. Imagine this, Allah Azza wa will never be displeased with you ever again. You think that's enough? Wallahi, it's not. The Prophet of Allah, he tells us in the authentic hadith. He says, Allah Azza wa will gather us once more. And he will say, O oh my servants, are you happy? Are you pleased? Are you content? And we will say, Oh Allah, what more could we possibly ask for? Oh Allah, you've given us everything that we've desired. Oh Allah, you've entered us into the paradise. You've given us all that which we desired. And oh Allah, you've promised us that you will never be displeased with us ever again. Oh Allah, what more could we possibly ever ask for? So Allah will say to you and I, my brothers and sisters, Allah will say, as of this moment, I will remove the veil and you will see me with your very eyes. Imagine seeing Allah. So the Sahaba asked, they said, our Prophet of Allah, will we really see Allah with our eyes? So the Prophet of Allah, he says, he points to the full moon. He says to them, do you see the full moon? They said, yes. He said, you will see Allah like you see the full moon with no difficulties whatsoever. This is the ultimate gift in Jannah, my brothers and sisters. This 50, 60 years that we're going to live here, Wallahi, it's nothing. For those of you who work hard, for those of you who hang on to their deen, know that this is what Allah has promised you. This is what Allah has promised the believers. Imagine seeing Allah with your own eyes. Imagine being in that environment where you... you, you everything your heart ever desires. But my brothers and sisters, Wallahi, if that is what you desire, then you have to work for it, man. Like how every one of us, he knows that if he wants to drive a Ferrari in this world, then he has to work hard. And if you want to live in a nice mansion, then you have to work doubly hard. If you're expecting that reward from Allah, know that you have to pay the ultimate price. And this is what it's all about. Sometimes people tell me, you know, I don't have that stamina to move forward. Never forget why you do what you do. When things get tough, remember that I want to see Allah. When things get tough, remember that I want to be of those who live in Jannah for eternity. And this is what drives us, my brothers and sisters. Wallahi, I want to thank you all for allowing me to come. I want to thank the organizers for bringing me here. Wallahi, I've, I've really loved Oslo, honestly. I've really enjoyed it. I believe you people are beautiful, beautiful people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this city. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring you all closer to the deen. My brothers and sisters, don't, don't waste these three days. 
Don't waste your time. Don't make these things like, you know, events that we attend. Make a move in your life, man. Wallahi, don't waste your life. You know, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will say to the believer, He will say to him, read Quran like you used to read in dunya. And the last verse that you stop at will be the level of Jannah that you will end up in. So imagine those that memorize the Quran. Then imagine you and I who only knew Kul Hu Allahu Ahad and Kul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falak. Wallahi, for every letter that you didn't memorize, Wallahi, you're going to kick yourself. That if I just worked that little bit harder, man, I would have made it. So my brothers, after these three days of, you know, mashallah, talk after talk, what are you going to do? What is your plan? What is your action plan? Are you going to be like everyone else who came, was entertained, went home and no change in his life? Or are you going to be from those people who are going to make promises to Allah? You know, my brothers, the race is on, the competition is on. Sahaba are already there. Where do you want to end up? Do you want to be with Rasulullah in Jannah? Do you want to be in first class? Or do you want to be right at the back next to the toilets, man? You make that choice, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all from the people of Firdaus al-A'la. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this city and to bless every single one of you and to guide every single one of us and the whole ummah at large. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I ask him to not take our souls until he is pleased with it. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastahfiruka wa natuhu. My brothers and sisters, I ask you, when you think about yourself and you think about Jannah, where do you see yourself? Are you just happy to just make it? Or are you of those very few people who want the high levels? Because my brothers and sisters, Wallahi, I have news for you. Don't think that Jannah is all the same. You know, my brothers, what pushes you to do what you do in this world? What makes you wake up every morning and go to work? What, your love for work? What makes you get up every morning and go to work? Your love for work? No. Your love for this. Because you know, right? I work because I need this and I need this so that I can get through my daily life. Yes or no? What makes you go to school in the morning? What? Your love for knowledge? No. But you know, I need to go to school to get a good education. Right? And with a good, you know, with a good education, then I can get a good job. And with a good job, it always comes back down to what? These ones. Today I'm here to tell you, why do we do what we do? Why do we fast? Why do we pray? Why do we hold these events? Why do you do what you do as a Muslim? It's also for these ones. But not here. There. Don't think for a second, my brothers. Jannah is the reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, for those that are successful on the day of judgment, I will reward them. What is Allah going to reward you? My brother and my sister, this is now very personal now. Because Allah is talking to you. With all of these difficulties in dunya, you know, through, throughout the three days, we've been trying to encourage you to become a better Muslim, to become a better Muslima, to become someone that's, you know, all of these things. But for why? What's the purpose? What's the payment? What is the reward? 
What is to happen? You know, if I become the best Muslim who's an active da'i, who's an active this and an active that, what's the reward? Allah says, if you are successful, if you pass for you, I have prepared something. My reward to you is something no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, no heart and no mind has ever imagined or contemplated. This is what I have prepared. This is what I have prepared for those believers that are successful. I have prepared for them a paradise, the likes of which no one has ever seen or heard or even imagined. comes and the hisab is finished and the tests and trials and tribulations are done you will the righteous will be moved in their hordes towards Jannah and those who are Allah conscious those who lived aware of Allah Rabbul Izzah will, move, will be moved in their hordes towards Jannah, in their groups towards Jannah. And when you look at them, you will see on their faces happiness. Wujuhun yawma'idhim musfira dahikatum mustabishira faces that they radiant glowing with happiness happy of the glad tiding that is to come alhamdulillah qiyamah is finished alhamdulillah hisab is done alhamdulillah my book is given in the right alhamdulillah i am at the doors of jannah hatta idha ja'uha until they reach the precipice of jannah and they imagine majestic gates huge but the gates are closed you will arrive in front of it and the Rasul will move forward to ask for the gates to be open so the Khazan says man ant who are you so he says Muhammad Rasulullah ah what an honor that you're of his nation so the angel says in the hadith is sahih ala shart al-bukhari and uh, you know classified by albani rahimahullah ta'ala so the angel says bika umirt i was ordered for you that i would not open this gate to any before you so imagine now the gates of jannah open and you will see inside it what the hadith the Qudsi says, Mala Ainun Raat, Wala Udunun Samiat, Wala Khatara Ala Kalbi Bashar. What no eye has ever seen, what no ear has ever heard, nor has it ever occurred on the imagination of man. The Jannah Ibn al Qayyim Lillahi Darru describes it from the Ahadith. This فَإِنْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ أَرْضِهَا وَتُرْبَتِهَا فَهِيَ الْمِسْكُ وَالزَّعْفَرَانِ If you ask about its soil and its sand, it is the sensation of misk and saffron. وَإِنْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ سَقْفِهَا فَهُوَ عَرْشُ الرَّحْمَانِ And if you ask about its ceiling, it is the throne of the beneficent. وَإِنْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ مِلَاطِهَا فَهُوَ الْمِسْكُ الْأَزْفَرُ وَإِنْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ حِسْبَائِهَا فَهُوَ اللُّؤْلُؤُ وَالْجَوْهَرُ If you were to ask about its cement, it is purified misk. If you were to ask of its stones and pebbles, it is jewels, emeralds and rubies. Can you imagine? You go to a jewelry shop, you look at a ring and it says $10,000 is just a little stone and Jannah is filled with it. And وَإِنْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ بِنَائِهَا If you were to ask of its buildings لَبِنَةٌ مِّن فِضَّةٍ وَلَبِنَةٌ مِّن ذَهَبٍ لَا مِنَ الْحَطَبِ وَخَشَبٍ وَإِنْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ أَشْجَارِهَا فَمَا فِيهَا مِنْ شَجَرَةٍ إِلَّا وَسَاقُهَا مِنْ ذَهَبٍ And if you were to ask of its buildings a brick of silver and a brick of gold not wood and clay and if you were to ask of its trees there's not a tree in Jannah except that its trunk is pure gold 
and the shade that would last the rider a hundred years under. So imagine you've just entered and Subhanal Khaliq, what a place. The, the scent, the perfume, the elegance. And as you, so you, 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 you're seeing it, but you haven't entered. And as you enter, the angels say, Salamun alaykum tibtum fadkhuluha khalidin. Peace be unto you. You did well. Enter it for eternity. And as you enter, wal malaikatu yadkhuluna alayhim min kulli bab. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum fa ni'ma uqba ad-dar. The angels will come from left, right and every door. Not to shout but to call nicely next to your ear. Peace be unto you. You did good. You are patient. Enjoy for eternity. Now you're in Jannah. My time is very limited, so I will race through this. And you will go to the houses in Jannah. A hadith of the Prophet. The Rasul says, I just want to give little snippets. The Rasul says, Dakhaltul Jannah. I entered Jannah. And what an honor that your prophet has seen it. He says, Dakhaltul Jannah, I entered Jannah. فَإِذَا أَنَا بِقَصْرٍ مِّن ذَهَبْ In front of me came a palace of pure gold. Can you imagine? Dazzling gold, walls of gold, pillars of gold, uh, paving gold, bedding gold, you know. So the prophet is dazzled by it. So he goes, لِمَنْ uh, هَذَا Whose palace is this? So in one of the ahadith, they say, لِرَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْعَرَبِ To a man of the Arabs. The other one is, لِفَتَّمْ مِّنْ قُرَيْشِ But to one of the men of the Arabs. So the Rasul says, I am from the Arabs. Who? So they said, a man from the Quraysh. So the Rasul says, I am from the Quraysh. So they said, someone from the Ummah of Muhammad. He said, I am Muhammad. Who is it? So they said, Umar ibn al-Khattab. This is the palace of Umar. In another hadith, it says, لِمَنْ هَذَا? It says, لَفَتَمْ مِنْ قُرَيْشِ It belongs to one of the youngsters of the Quraysh. So the Rasul says, فَظَنَنْتُ أَنِّي أَنَا هُ I thought I am it. But you know, talking about the sons of the Quraysh, I am the prince of Quraysh. So obviously it is mine. So who says, لِمَنْ مَنْ هُوَ? Who is it? It says, Umar ibn al-Khattab. So the Rasul says, I wanted to enter it. I, re I remembered your sense of honor with regards to your family and your women. So I stayed out, Ya Umar. Umar is sitting. Fabaka Umar, he started to cry. He says, ka agaru ya Rasulullah. O, o Rasul of Allah, will I have ghira with regards to my women when it's concerning you? Our mother, Khadija Kubra, radiallahu anha, she's coming one day carrying food for the Rasul. Jibreel comes from above the seventh heavens telling him, O Prophet of Allah, Khadija is about to enter. She's carrying food for you. When look at the honor and the status of this lady. Allah Rabbul Izzah has sent Jibreel from above the seven heavens to do what? Go to Muhammad, tell him that Allah has sent Salam, his person, to Khadija Te Kubra. Aqra'a has Salam, tell her Allah says Salam Ya Khadija. So Jibreel comes. You know, Ya Muhammad, aqra'ha salam, tell her salam, mir rabbiha, from her Lord. And then Jibreel says, wa minni, and tell her salam from me too. And then, wa bashirha bi baytin fil jannah min qasab, and give her the glad tidings of a house in jannah made from a single pearl. Wal qasabu fil lughati, yani al lu'lu'a mujawwafa, an unadulterated pearl, perfect. One, can you imagine like a little pearl is a, a lot of money. It's a, a palace is made of pearl. So this is the abodes of Jannah. And you know, there's so much, so much to talk about, but I, uh, my time is excessively limited. So you enjoy the whole of Jannah. Imagine you will sit on necks of birds and point to that place and that bird will fly like in Harry Potter's movie. It will go straight there to that side and then you'll go maybe, no, that side it will fly to that side. This is, can you imagine the joy in Jannah? All of that is one thing. And then an amazing day comes. You're in Jannah. Enjoying the, you know, the beauty of Jannah. And Jannah is beautiful.
a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, O Messenger of Allah, which deed is the most beloved of all deeds to Allah? Think about the simple question. And what was the response? Instantaneously, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, praying Salah at its proper time. Praying Salah at its proper time. There is simply no overstressing, no exaggerating how important the prayers are. There is no other deed in which one's faith is as clearly manifested. There is no other pillar that is, is as, as integral as the pillar of the Salah. And the number of verses and the number of traditions that mention Salah are simply too many and too explicit to mention here. But of the most powerful ones, and the structure of this wording is not found in any other hadith, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the difference between Iman and Kufr is the Salah. Whoever abandons the Salah, it is as if he has committed kufr. No other deed has been mentioned in this manner. And of course, it's really a true manifestation of what it means. One of our scholars mentioned that Iblis was asked to do one prostration and he refused. Imagine the one who is being called more than 20 times a day for Fajr, for Dhuhr, for Asr, for Maghrib, for Isha, and he keeps on refusing, 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 refusing. What would be the status of that person? You really want to enter Jannah, one of the best and most easiest ways, one of the crucial ways, one of the essential ways to enter Jannah is to be amongst those who pray. When the people of Jahannam are asked, the Quran says in Surah al Mudath, when the people of Jahannam are are asked, ما سلككم في سقر? How did you end up in the fires of hell? The first thing that they say, قالوا لم نكو من المصلين. We were not of those who used to pray. And subhanallah, some people say, oh, why are you using these scare tactics to uh, encourage people to pray, uh, to uh, frighten them into not praying? And the response is, well, the Quran and Sunnah is quite clear in this regard that both rewards and punishments are uh, used as incentives. And the prayer is mentioned as an incentive. Certain things are mentioned and other things are mentioned as a means of punishment. And as for the incentives, that too there are so many that can be mentioned. Of them is the famous hadith of the Prophet wasallam, in which he said that he asked the companions that, what do you think the cleanliness of a person would be if he took a bath five times a day? I mean, who takes a bath five times a day? And they said he would be absolutely spotless. He would be completely clean. As we say in English, as clean as a whistle. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, this is the example of the Salah. The one who prays five times a day has no sin or evil left upon him. In fact, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala literally links the Salah with the highest Jannah, Jannah Al-Firdaus. Open up Surah Al-Mu'minun and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ the very first thing that Allah says, the believers are successful. Who are the believers? Those that are, they have humility and they have khushu' in their uh, prayers. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that continuous salah is a mechanism to get his pleasure and praise. One of the most important aspects of the salah when it comes to the Quran, the Quran hardly ever, in fact, one can truly say never says sallu or, or pray. Rather, the Quran says yuqimuna salah, iqamat salah establishing the salah and establishing the salah. This is the fundamental way that Allah describes the prayer, not to pray, but rather to establish salah. And what this means is that we make the salah a primary pillar of our daily lives. When we establish something, its presence is there, it becomes permanent. So the believer, the mu'min, the Muslim is the one who takes his schedule and puts it all around his salawat and does not feed his salat into his daily schedule. The Muslim plans his schedule around the salah and not the other way around. In fact, from the very beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ Those who establish the salah and they give the zakah. 
Salah as well teaches us to humble ourselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the essence of Iman and Taqwa, to lower our heads. We take our faces, which are the most noble part of our bodies, and we willingly lower them onto the very ground where our feet walk. This is the ultimate manifestation of humility. No one else, nothing else deserves that level of humility other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the sajda is the most praiseworthy status that a person can have, or the most praiseworthy uh, structure that a human being can be in. The most praiseworthy pose that a human can be in is that of the sajda. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the closest that a person is to his Lord is when he is in sajda. And so increase your du'as in the sajda. Our Prophet Wasallam also told us that the salah will become a light for us in our graves and a light for us on the day of judgment. We are told as well that the one who prays regularly, that person is essentially guaranteed Jannah. In the hadith, the famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet Wasallam said, that the one who prays regularly, that the first thing that Allah will ask a person will be about is his salah. And if his salah was in order and everything was fine, then the rest of all of his deeds will be considered to be in order. And if his salah was in disorder, then the rest of all his deeds will also be in disorder. And so if your salah was in check, then subhanAllah, everything else is going to be in check as well. And our Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam guaranteed that whoever protects his five prayers, he ha protects, you hafid, he has a guarantee from Allah that he shall be entered into Jannah. And of course the meaning here is that the one who protects the prayers, obviously uh, he is going to make sure that the rest of his lifestyle will also be done in a very positive manner. And our scholars mention that salah is not just something that brings about spiritual blessings. No, salah also brings us worldly benefits. Of them is that salah gives us mental stability. Salah makes us content with what we are uh, given. It gives us a sense of dignity, a sense of persistence and patience. Salah teaches us patience and that's why sabr and salah are constantly linked together as well because we are constantly having to monitor ourselves, constantly having to make sure that we're praying our time. Salah in fact teaches us logistical planning, especially as we live in these minority lands where there are no masajid in every second you know, street corner or whatnot. Rather we have to plan our schedules around the salah. So it actually teaches us how to plan better. And it gives us a sense of logistical uh, 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 rationality and understanding. As well, salah gives us a sense of optimism by removing us from our daily routine, by removing us from our problems and hurdles and the hustle and bustle of daily life and causing us to have a private and quiet conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no matter what's happening, come time for salah, we shut off our work, we go to our corner, we literally say Allahu Akbar and we enter into a bubble, we enter into a private conversation that is devoid of anything of this world. It's just us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what a sense of peace comes, what a sense of tranquility comes. And that is why whenever our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was troubled, he would rush to prayer because prayer gave him the comfort that he uh, needed. And that is why as well, salah brings a sense of peace and contentment to the heart. Dear brothers and sisters, we learn in our religion that the rituals of Islam will be stripped away one pillar at a time. And our Prophet sallallahu said, the last pillar to be stripped away will be that of salah. Once that is stripped away, nothing remains. I remind myself and all of you that it is high time that we stopped trivializing this pillar and we started incorporating the salah into our daily lives. The difference between the Muslim and the non-Muslim, the difference between the real Muslim and the Muslim by name is the salah. If you truly want to be a Muslim, submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala primarily through the salah and the salah will then bring you closer to Allah in many other ways. Some people say, but Ya Shaykh, I am doing this sin and I have this issue and 
and this and that, I feel guilty to pray. And I say, the sin of not praying is bigger than any other sin that you are doing. Go ahead and pray and slowly but surely work on the other sin as well. Allah says in the Quran, Inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. Salah will prevent you from other sins, all types of indecent deeds and all types of evil deeds. So gain patience and perseverance through the salah and use the salah to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Start praying with only the fard prayers. If you're not praying regularly, just go ahead and only the fard. Once you've done the fard, or if you're doing the fard, work your way to the sunan. If you're doing the sunan, you work your way to some nawafil. If you're doing all of that, there is no end to the quality of the salah. So whatever stage you are in, perfect that stage, rise up to the next stage, and keep on aiming to better the salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala res- resurrect us with the true musalleen, the people who pray. We seek Allah's refuge from ever being resurrected with those people who do not pray. The whole Quran is special and every part of it is going to have something to benefit you. But is it okay to have a favorite surah or to recite something repeatedly or listen to it because It resonates with you in a certain way, maybe because of where you're at in life at the moment? Absolutely. The Prophet himself was most moved by the verses that reminded him of his responsibility. The verse in Surah Nisa, how will it be when we bring forth a witness upon every nation and we bring you, O Muhammad as a witness upon them? He wept profusely and he couldn't even handle any more of its recitation or the time he spent the entire night reciting just one ayah and crying. In tu'adhibhum fa'innahum ibaduk wa in takhfir lahum fa'innaka anta al-aziz al-hakim. If you punish them, O Allah, they are your slaves. But if you forgive them, verily you alone are the Almighty and the All-Wise. And he was asked sallallahu alayhi wa about a man who used to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas at the end of his recitation in every single prayer. And when he asked the companions to ask the man why he recites Qul Hu Allahu Ahad so frequently, the man responded, he said, because it's Sifatul Rahman, wa anu ahibu an aqra abiha, because it's a description of the most merciful. And I love to read the description of the most merciful. So the Prophet said, go back and tell that man that Allah loves him because of his love for that surah. A person who is in distress may find something extremely beautiful about Surah Yusuf. Ar-Rahman and Surah Yasin are dear to so many people. Then we start to find the Prophet ﷺ talking about how particular surahs benefit you in the station. So he said, recite the Qur'an, for on the day of resurrection it will come as an intercessor for its reciters. Then he said, recite the two brightly illuminated chapters, Surah Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran. He said, for on the day of resurrection, they will come as if they were two clouds or two shades or two flocks of birds. And they will be arguing on behalf of their companions. Now imagine a person walking on the day of judgment and Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran are like two canopies, two flocks of birds, two clouds that are following you and that everyone is admiring and wishing they had done so as well, wishing they had committed those surahs to their memory and acted upon them as well. And that's why the Prophet said, recite Surah Al-Baqarah. For doing so produces blessing in this life and abandoning it produces regret in the next life. The Prophet also mentioned some of these other short portions that we recite on a daily basis. In another authentic hadith, the Prophet said, Whoever recites Ayatul Kursi, Allahu la ilaha illahu, after every one of the prescribed prayers, the Prophet said, nothing is standing between him and his entrance into paradise except for death. Meaning it is guaranteed for him at that point that he's going to enter into Jannah. So we've covered Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and then Al-Ikhlas and Ayatul Kursi. Now there is one more companion, and this is what the scholars say is the persistent intercessor. And it is known as the surah that is al-mani'ah, the preventer, and it's also al-munjiyah, the rescuer. And that is Surah Al-Mulk. The surah that the Prophet ﷺ said that the one who recites it every night will be protected from the punishment of the grave. 
And some of the scholars said it prevents one from doing the deeds that warrant the punishment of the grave. And its virtue and its recitation itself prevents the punishment of the grave. It is such a beautiful and powerful surah. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ said in another narration that there are 30 verses, one surah in the Qur'an, that will show up on the Day of Judgment. 30 verses and will intercede on behalf of its companion. One narration he said, خَاصَمَتْ لِصَاحِبِهَا It will continue to argue on behalf of its companion حَتَّى يُخْفَرَ لَهُ Until that person is certainly forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this Qur'an, as much as it is shifa, it's a healing in this life, it's so much more for you in the next. And from the moment you enter your grave to the moment of your entrance into paradise, all it keeps on bringing is elevation. And that too is true of the life that we live in now. Last time we spent time learning about Jannah. When was the last time you kept your eyes on that which is the greatest of prize, which is Jannah, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having this understanding and this reminder and that knowledge with sincerity and yaqeen will flip your life upside down in a good way. You see Sahaba like Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu an, early time, early Islam, Muslims were being persecuted and the command to emigrate from Mecca to Medina, escape, run for your life. And Rasulullah already traveled. So Suhaib was trying to do his best to escape, but he was caught by the kuffar of Quraysh, disbelievers. And they said, you think you will leave Mecca just like that? You did business, you made money in our city, and now you'll go just so simple to Medina? No way impossible. We will not let go of you so you can do whatever you want and join the man you believe is a prophet until you give away every single penny that you have. So he says, if, in if I give you all of my wealth and I tell you where I hid all my treasures, we're good to go, you're good to go. They would not imagine someone will give away all his savings in his life to go. For what? What is it on the other hand? And he tells them, my treasure is hidden in such and such location. Go there and find it. They found it. They released him. He left everything behind. His retirement, 401k, whatever saving is all gone. And as he's traveling and arriving to Medina after hundreds of miles of traveling, he was told, Rabih al Bay Aba Yahya. Aba Yahya, that was a successful transaction. Aba Yahya paid hundreds of thousands or millions or whatever the currency at that time and the amount. Okay, what did he get in return? Allah says in the Quran, the, the Sahaba, they say it was revealed, this ayah, because of Suhaib al-Rumi. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ بِتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ There are people who sell their soul to Allah. And he sold everything in dunya for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ In return, the pleasure of Allah. And where do you get the pleasure of Allah? Where will you hear it? In Jannah. Jannah is what made him sell the dunya. You hear a Sahabi Haram ibn Milhan radiallahu an. Rasulullah sallam gets an invite. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need du'at people who call to Allah to give da'wah to our people in Najd in Saudi Arabia today. Okay, or that middle uh, part of the country. Send them to us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not know this was a plot against him. Wal-Iyadu Billah. May Allah protect us. So he sent them the elite of du'at and speakers and people of the Qur'an and knowledge and ulama to give da'wah. Haram ibn Milhan was one of them. As he was giving da'wah to the leader of that tribe, that leader gave a wink to someone behind. And the one behind got a spear. Focus on Haram ibn Milhan. He does not know what's happening behind. And that man with the spear, he throws it. The hadith authentic. It says the spear came from the back, exited from the stomach. The hadith says, فَخَرَجَ الدَّمْ الدَّمْ The blood. And he grabbed the blood with his hand. وَنَضْحَهُ فِي وَجْهِهِ And he put it in his face. And he said, فُسْتُ وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَ He said, I won by the Lord of the Kaaba. I won, I won. What did you win? He just lost your life. But he won, inshaAllah, Jannah. 
The eyes is on the prize. This dunya is temporary. Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba. How do we know the story? Allah allowed it to be revealed to us. The people around were impressed. How can someone at the weakest point in his life, the soul is exiting the body and he says, I'm a winner. I want to feel that way. Not just on my lowest point, or even the best point in my life. It's Jannah, Jannah. Rasulullah continuously made it possible, related it to us. How did he say that? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ma bayna bayti wa minbari, between my podium and my house, one of the gardens of Jannah. May Allah grant you all to be able to pray in that spot and rawda. May Allah make it possible for all of you. The ulama, they say, would Allah allow someone to pray in the rawda, a mu'min, and not grant it to him in Akhirah, the ultimate Jannah. May Allah make it for all of us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. He made it tangible. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever prays 12 raka'at voluntarily, two before Fajr, four before Duhr, that's six so far, two after Maghrib, and two after Isha, and I missed the two after Duhr. So two before Fajr, four before Duhr, two after Duhr, Two after Maghrib, two after Isha, 12. Whoever does that, then Allah will build you a house in Jannah. Let's be very honest with one another. Very likely, many, many of us, Allah Alam, maybe if the attendees in this message, may Allah grant you the best of dunya and akhirah. Many of us will die, we'll never own a house. Like in Detroit, well, in Dearborn, well, West Bloomfield, you'll never even own a house. You might, very likely, some of us may die and we still have debt. May Allah lift our debt, Ya Rabb. Pray 12 raka'at, and I'm not saying a house in New York City or Manhattan. No, I'm telling you a house in Jannah. The square foot in Jannah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the square foot is more valuable than the whole earth and whatever is on it. Then what about a house? A square foot. This is how Jannah related to us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jannah is closer to you than your slippers. What, what does that mean? Min shiraki na'li. You can attain it. It's not impossible. You don't go see images like, I'll never own this thing. I will never. No, it's closer to you than your slippers. That means you can achieve it. You can make it. You can do it. It's not impossible. All of us can make it. May Allah grant it to all of us. Everyone in this masjid, everyone listening, has a house in Jannah and has a house in Jahannam. Every single one. Rasulullah teaches us. Baytun fil Jannah wa baytun fil nar. May Allah make us people of Jannah and inherit the houses of the people who went to Hatnar. Had a worth. Allah says in the Quran about worth, it's inheritance. May Allah protect us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Very relatable. Even one time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does he tell Bilal ibn Rabah? Radiallahu an? He says, When I went and I saw Jannah, I heard your footsteps. Shuf, Jannah's done. It's just waiting for you to come back. Bas. Jannah is done. Rasulullah says, I heard your footsteps, Ya Bilal. Bilal, what do you think you did that made you make me hear your footsteps while you're still in dunya? He says, if there's an action, it is possibly because after every time I make wudu, I pray to rak'at. Perhaps that's it. Ya akhi, I know it's not a wajib. But let me push myself when I talk about Jannah. And you push yourself after you hear about Jannah and be as consistent as you can to pray two raka'at after every wudu. May Allah make it easy for all of us. And remember Bilal and perhaps Rasulullah would hear your footsteps. Maybe in the Akhirah, Amir Rabbil Alameen. And may Allah grant you his companionship. All these things are ready. This is your back home. We tell, ask someone, where's back home for you? Uh, well, someone says, my back home, for example, is Palestine, Palestine. May Allah lift the zulum and oppression from it. I mean, were you born there, Akhi? No, I wasn't born there. But why do you say you're from Palestine? Because of my father. Okay. Your father, was he born there? Honestly, no, he was actually born in uh, one of the Gulf countries. But why do you say you're from Palestine? Because my grandpa. Oh, he was born. Yes, he was born. Can I ask you, why did you not stop at your birthplace? Like you're from this city or this country. Why did you go to your father? Why did you not stop at your father? Why did you just stop at grandpa? Keep going. What do you mean? Keep go up. Go up the family tree. Go to great grandpa. Where is he from? Maybe Iraq. No, no, go further. Where is he from? Maybe India. Yeah, he go all the way up to the first insan human being. Where is he? Who is he? Adam alayhi salam. And where is he from? Jannah. 
So what's back home for you and I? It's Jannah. May Allah make us all go back home. And you know what does it mean when you go back home? You know every light switch. You don't feel like you're a stranger. Allah says, Al Jannah, what? Arrafaha lahum. Allah says in the Quran, we made Jannah. You know it better than how you know your own house. Allahu Akbar. Because you're back home. So don't ever let go of back home for some dunya that is not our homes. We're here just, we're just, this is all rental property, even you own, though you think you own it. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we shall return. Jannah is there. May Allah make you all of its inhabitants. Amir Rabbil Alameen. And I'm not saying this talk or Rasulullah said we learn from him just to like, you know what, get us like, wow, get us inspired and no action. No, there's action involved. Oh, there's action. When I tell you about Jannah, you'll do everything necessary to make up for it, inshaAllah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a sahabi jahima, he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I want to go aghzu jihad fi sabilillah. And I'm coming to consult with you. He said, Hallaka min um, is your mom alive? Jahima, his mom needs him. Jahima, your mom is alive? Qala na'am. He says, falzamha, stick to your mom. Jannah is under her feet. So Jannah was being used to fix family problems. This is how you look at your mom. You try to be creative. You try to be like, you know what? I want to go to Jannah. I'm going to go travel to this place and give da'wah and donate. That's all good. May Allah grant you Jannah. But please, I ask you by the one who made you prioritize your life. Jannah that you're looking for is under the respected old lady's feet in that living room in your house. And where are you going? Don't you ever leave the Jannah until that Jannah is pleased. The one who's stepping on it, the one Jannah is under, make sure she's pleased. May Allah make our moms pleased by us. Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah forgive us the way we treat our parents. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. Then you see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi, when I used to go to school without going to a lot of depth, I generally did not enjoy studying engineering. Finished, alhamdulillah, may Allah grant us all success, dunya and akhirah. But going there was difficult until hearing this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Man salaka tariqa, whoever seeks a path to gaining knowledge, Whoever seeks a path to gain knowledge, سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make your path to Jannah easy. Some ulama, they say this includes secular, for the sake of Allah, and deen and religious studies as well. Now for sure, Islamic studies. So as you go to a halaqa, you go to learn something, you come to Khubbat al-Jum'ah, you're struggling, difficult, finding a parking, know that difficulty will make your path to Jannah easy, inshaAllah. So it fixes the whole education system when you talk about Jannah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for those struggling to find the appropriate spouse, right? Where are the good men? Some sisters ask. Where are the good women? Some brothers ask. Don't you ever forsake Jannah for an inappropriate relationship. I ask you by Allah, do not sell Jannah for some dunya. How do I fix this Jannah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَمَا فِي الْجَنَّةِ أَعْزَبْ No one goes to Jannah single. Alhamdulillah. Everyone goes to Jannah married, insha'Allah. May Allah grant us the best of wives in dunya and akhirah. Best of spouses, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Talk about Jannah when you hear someone having a struggle, death in the family. Use Jannah to fix that problem. A man went to Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He says, Ma tali ibnan, I lost two children. Tell me something the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught you all so I can feel better. He says, yes, we have a hadith for you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about the children that die. They will be in Jannah. In Akhirah, these kids will come to the Abba, Al-Abu, the father or both parents and will grab him by the thawb. And dad, come with me. Mom, come with me. Hatta yudkhilahu Allahu wa abawahu al-Jannah. Until Allah grant that child and the parents all Jannah. That father might have went to Jahannam. That father might have been get punished. He's a Muslim, but he has a lot of sins. Wallahu ta'ala alam. But because of the death of the child many years ago, that child will grab him, come with me. And that was the one who saved him by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That man feels comfortable. Jannah. For the one who lost a child above the age of puberty. The hadith I mentioned was under. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? When Allah grabs the soul of a child above the age of puberty, Allah asks the angels, how did you find my slave reacting to this calamity? They said, Hamadaka was starja. He praised you, Ya Allah. He said, Alhamdulillah. All praise due to Allah. I will not question your wisdom, O Allah. To Allah I belong and to Allah I shall return. Allah says, therefore, due to his reaction to this calamity, Ibnu lahu baytan fil jannah. 
build them a house in Jannah and call the house Baytul Hamd, the house of praise. Fixing all these things, one last one. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man faqad habibatayh, whoever loses his beloved, which means what? The sight. May Allah protect our sight. May Allah make us see that which is halal. May Allah forgive us from seeing that which is haram. May Allah protect us and grant us not just sight, but also insight. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. May Allah allow us to see the fitna and how to avoid it, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So the Prophet says, whoever lost his beloved, his sight, was sabr and was patient, wahtasab and was hoping for the reward, there's no other reward to that person other than Jannah. So Jannah, Jannah fixing our problems in every shape and, and avenue. May Allah protect us and grant it to all of us, Ameen Rabbil Alameen. We spoke a lot about Jannah, alhamdulillah. Let's go to Jannah. Let's talk about Jannah, inshaAllah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the day of judgment takes place. We are all resurrected. Our parents, great-grandparents, all people till Adam alayhi salam. All humans are resurrected. Hisab, judgment, the scale, may Allah make it all pass and successful to all of us. Ya Rabb. We go, alhamdulillah, on the gates of Jannah. Yalla, ready to open? La, with all due respect, it's not open for you first. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ati bab al-Jannah. I am the one who comes to the door of Jannah and I knock. And the people, the gatekeepers of Jannah, they ask, Man and who are you? He says, Adam Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. They say, for you, we were commanded to open and the doors open. Yalla, bismillah, go. There is organization. There's group after group. The first group that enters Jannah, they have the beauty of the full moon. May Allah make you all of the first group, Ya Rabb. Second group, they have the, bright, the brightness of the brightest star and it goes on and on. Then we go to Jannah, listen to the four announcements. Number one, an announcement is made that you shall live in Jannah and you will never die. Allahu Akbar, no fear of death. Whatever you want to do in Jannah, enjoy. Anything you want in Jannah, just do it. No fear of death or injury. Number two, go to Jannah, you'll always be young and strong and you will never be old. Beautiful. Number three, you will go to Jannah, you will always be healthy and you will never ever be sick. Number four and last, وَأَنَّ لَكُمْ فِيهَا أَن To have the blessings, the ni'am, and the happiness and the joy and you will never be sad again in your life. You will always have state of happiness. Yalla, we enter. The Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, how are the homes in Jannah? He said, a brick of gold and a brick of silver. That's the fence. That's the fence, brothers and sisters. That's the fence. He says, the balat, the, the hajar, the rocks are gold and silver. You want to go pave your ground today. Not concrete, you want to do pavers, rocks. People know how much this costs. A small amount is like $5,000. One car driveway is probably $15,000. I'm talking your pavers are gold and silver. We didn't even enter. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Hasba'uha lu'lu. You know people have river rock as the whole landscaping, some rocks. Your landscaping will be pearls. Lu'lu. And you would walk, step on it, you're like, oh, that's pearls. We have a lot of it, alhamdulillah. That's a, that's a level of luxury that you will have in Jannah. Enjoy this beautiful scenery. You see all the palm trees that you have. Rasulullah says, Yulhamuna tasbih. You will say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar, you will say it without consciousness, just like how you breathe, though you never thought about it. That's how amazing Jannah is. Unbelievable. You go to Jannah, you will never have any need to go to a bathroom. You go to Jannah, you will have nothing nasty coming out of your nose or anything of that sort. Wala marad, no sickness. You go to Jannah, Allahu Akbar, and you have your spouse that Allah promised you. You go to Jannah, there's a shopping center we go to every Jumu'ah Friday. May Allah make us of the visitors and the guests of that mall, Ya Rabb. فَتَأْتِي رِيحٌ مِنَ الشَّمَالِ Northern winds, they, it comes and it comes on your face, on your body, on your clothes. فَيَزْدَادُوا جَمَالَ You look better and better. So then you go back home, your spouse and family tells you, you looked better than when you left. And you say, and you too look better than when I left. You go to Jannah. Wallahi, where do we start? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the lowest level in Jannah, lowest, it will take you 1,000 years to pass by your property. How long will it take me? Let's be honest. How long will it take me for you to give me a tour of your house? How long? 15 minutes? That's my basement, first floor. I also have, I have this backyard here. Check my garage out. How long will it? 15? Yeah, how big is your house? Two hour tour? 
multi-million dollar house in Miami, how long? Five hours? Rasulullah says, Alf sana, 1,000 years just to pass by your property. Adna, that's the lowest level is in Jannah. Wallahi, what dollar are we willing to sacrifice akhir of war? What dollar of haram that we're willing to put in our pocket to sell the Jannah for? What a relationship haram that we're accepting upon ourselves and sell Jannah for? What is it in this dunya that is pushing us to give up the permanent joy for some temporary fake joy in this dunya? May Allah grant me and all of us wisdom, Ya Rabbil Alameen. You go to Jannah, Allah says, I have prepared for you in Jannah that which your eyes have never seen. You've seen a lot. You traveled a lot. How big is your sight? How much have you seen? Grow that circle. And things your ears have never heard of. Usually you hear about more things than what you see. You heard about the wall of China. You heard about the pyramids in Egypt. You heard about the Amazon River, but you never went to it. So it's more than what you've heard. And something you've never imagined. How big is that circle of imagination? You've imagined things that don't even exist. Allah says it exceeds all these three. Much and much more. So then at the end, Allah tells all people in Jannah, Are you happy? So we all say, Ya Allah, how could we not be pleased? Allah said there's more. So we say there's more? What's more? He says that I will be pleased by you عليكم, and I will never ever be angry at you or have any wrath on you. Always a hundred percent of rida and pleasure upon you. So we get excited now. الحجاب, there's a curtain. Allah reveals himself and we see Allah. We see Allah Jalla Jalaluh. Faces beautiful, bright, gorgeous. إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ You see Allah clearly. No, um, nothing ambiguous, nothing unclear about it. You see Allah and the best part of this hadith or one of the most beautiful parts, the Prophet says, there's nothing in Jannah more beautiful than seeing Allah. And wallah, it makes sense. There's nothing in Jannah more beautiful than seeing Allah. So I remind myself and remind you all, don't let anything in this dunya come at the expense of you not seeing Allah. Just remember this. Is this seeing you're watching worth it to sacrifice you seeing Allah? La wallah. La wallah. Think of it this way. Think of Jannah. Think of seeing Allah and know that Jannah is not cheap. Jannah requires work. You call it hustling. You call it, you know, 100% effort, 110, whatever you want to call it. That's what Jannah needs and much more. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah inna sil'at Allahi ghali, Allah's product is expensive. He repeats it. Ala inna sil'at Allahi ghali, Allah's product is expensive. Allah's product is Jannah. Requires blood, requires sweat, requires some sacrifice of money, health, sleep, but no all for a nice, beautiful paycheck from Allah Jalla Jalalu. Jazak min indillah. May Allah grant it to all of you, Amir Rabbil Alameen. How would you like to know that a certain person is from the people of Jannah? Now, like if I tell you, this guy is from the people of Jannah. Can we say that? As our aqidah, as people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we cannot confirm to anyone that he is 100% from the people of Jannah or he is 100% from the people of the Hellfire. But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave us a sign. In many ahadith, I will mention three of them. Rasulullah said, soon you will be able to find out who are the people of Jannah and who are the people of the hellfire. They said, how Ya Rasulullah? He said, with praise and condemnation, you are Allah's witnesses upon one another. That's the first hadith. Second hadith, a janazah passed by and the Sahaba praised the deceased. So Rasulullah said, it has became certain, it became certain, it became certain. Then another janazah passed by and the Sahaba condemned the guy. They said bad things about the deceased. Rasulullah said, wajabat, wajabat, wajabat. He said the same exact thing. He said, Ya Rasulullah, the first one we praised, you say wajabat. And the second one we, we condemned and you said wajabat. He said, the first one that you praised, wajabat lahul jannah.
Jannah. The one that you praised in the beginning, Jannah became a must, became due to him. And the one you condemned, Jahannam, hellfire, became due to him or to her. Third hadith, final hadith. The people of Jannah are the ones whom Allah fill their ears with the praise of people while they are listening. And the people of the hellfire are the people whom Allah fill their ears with condemnation, people's condemnation, and they are listening. Now, if you look at that, all the three ahadith, what is that sign that indicate that a person who's walking among us, living among us, is from the people of Jannah or from the people of the hellfire? It is the reputation among the community. What do people say about you? And don't get that confused by doing things to please people. No, 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 no. The, the amal will be multiplied by zero. Naturally, by nature, you love to help. By nature, you always visit the sick. By nature, you look where is there's a janazah. By nature, whoever is tight in his finances, you go and support him. By nature, you love to do this amal because... Allah ordered you, number one, they bring you close to Allah. And this is, this becomes, look at the last hadith. Rasulullah said, Allah filled his ears with praise while he's listening. طيب, when Allah fills his ear with the praise, he's obviously listening. Why is the word, and he's listening? I mean, it's filled with his ears. He's obviously listening. This is for exaggeration of how good is that person that his reputation became so good that wherever he goes, people talk about him. This man, wallahi, ya Allah, I remember when I needed this, he was there for me. When I moved, he came to help me. When I was in the hospital, he visited me. When I was going through hardship, he was the first one who came and put money in the bank for me. He's always there for me or the other kind and subhanallah we can name so many from our hukam uh -huh. you know who's always you know you could you hear this guy cursed him this guy cursed him everywhere you go they are cursing that president they're cursing that king they're cursing that ruler because of what they have done to their people their their ears themselves is filled with the condemnation of the people and they're hearing it on a daily basis subhan rasulullah the hadith is blunt straightforward the people of the hellfire whom their reputation in the community, in the country, in the state, in the village, is evil. Everybody is, oh, brother, let's go visit that guy. Oh, please leave me alone. I don't want to even see him. Or on the, the contrary, you know, ah, oh, subhanallah, wallahi, yani, anytime you need this brother, you, you find him there. You need it, you have a problem? Go to this brother. He will always help you. Subhanallah. So, ya akhwan, this is an opportunity. This is a great opportunity from Rasulullah sallallahu to know Am I from the people of Jannah or am I from the people of the hellfire? Of course, there's nothing called guaranteed because it all the amal are by the way they end, right? So, but I can, inshallah ta'ala, always help in any form. Be generous, be kind, be loving, be caring, especially to your family, especially to your spouse, especially to your parents. Huh? And then anybody in need, be the first one. Do not wait for your brother who told you already that he lost his job. Do not wait for him to tell you, brother, I'm in need. Yani somebody lost his job and he's been out of work for three, four months. What do you expect? You by yourself. By yourself. This is the true brother. Wallahi, a brother came to me the other day and he said, Staz, remember a few years ago when this, 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 and this happened? Of course, of course I remember. He said, brother so-and-so, Wallahi, came to me. And without me noticing, he put in my pocket $5,000 and he left. I said, since that day, he said, Wallahi, even though I gave it back to him, uh -huh, but I will never forget what he has done to me. Never. Subhanallah. So these are the brothers that, you know, you're always mentioning them with good. Anytime that uh, you need help, who's the first person who comes to your mind? That's the brother we're talking about. Are you that brother? When people are going through hardship or they need any kind of help, are you the person that comes to mind or are you the last person that come to mind? Because you're going to give so many excuses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from the people of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us away from the hellfire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Does Quran mention beautiful spouses in paradise? Yes, he does. There's no hiding from it. And actually, when I was in my exploring religion phase, this is one of the things that I couldn't answer for myself. Why does God mention this? And actually, of course, none of you sisters have this question, but you know sisters that have this question. Brother, Quran talks about these spouses for men in paradise. What do women get? 
So I'm just talking to that someone. You can tell them about their confusion when we're done with this discussion. <laughs> but the question actually arose in my mind too. What's the, what's the deal with these kinds of like sensual rewards and beautiful women and all of this stuff? And they're physically being described to in a society, men in a society that are exposed to, to fahsha all the time. The thing that the Prophet fears for his ummah is shamelessness the most. And our religion compared to any other is the most conservative and the most restricting when it comes to interactions between men and women. Even the code of people coming and knocking on your door, that, that they shouldn't just walk into your house, let the women make the arrangements and be in a separate place and all of that. Like There's like a proper code and so much so that there are hours of the, of the day where your children can't walk into the bedroom. They have to knock outside. You have to have, you have, to have code put in your home for, for gender interaction. It's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. How, you know, boys after a certain age or kids after a certain age can't share a blanket. And then the exact opposite is described in Jannah. Right? This is a young man, he's got no restriction, he's got beautiful spouses and this and that, and they're this beautiful and that beautiful, and they're, you know, they're, they're, their attributes are being described. It's only a matter of Allah's brilliant justice that in Jannah, the drinks that we were forbidden, He offers. The joys we denied ourselves, Allah offers and says, look how you held yourself back, here you go, enjoy. Go ahead, I've opened that door for you. So it's actually the reversal of the, the same restrictions Allah has put on us in this dunya. That's why haya is so important here. You want a party in Jannah, you better watch your haya here. Now, the second issue is Allah described this for men, how come He didn't describe this such a thing equivalent for women. We get multiple wives, how come they don't have multiple husbands, etc, etc. If you want to be really crude about it. So, I was asked to conduct an experiment. It was an experiment with a bunch of teenage boys and a bunch of teenage girls. And to both, the question to be asked was, so if you could have anything you want, as many times as you want, without any restrictions, nobody will find out, you won't get any trouble, and it's not going to be, you're not even religiously liable. You could have whatever you want right now, what would it be? Okay, what would it be? And so like about a hundred boys are being asked that are teens, and a hundred girls are being asked that are teens. The boys have an ijma in the ummah. There's no like variation. I mean, other than spelling errors, there are, there are no... <laughs> there's no diversity in the answers. The interesting response actually comes from the girls. And by the way, the boys saying that, it confirms what Allah Himself said, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahawati min nisa Men were programmed with desire for women. Allah beautified it in them. Done. And just proof of that. The girls were the interested, interesting answers. Can we have five more minutes? Just a couple more minutes. Just two more, just two, two more minutes. They hand you the paper. No, no, can I have it back? Can I have it back? Just, I, I just thought of something else. Crossing it over. Crossing it over again. And then multiple answers. I can't think of one thing. My favorite answer that was given by multiple sisters, not all of them, but multiple. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it's too good. It's too good. Other, I just want to be with my mom. Some said a pony. So, like, all kinds of answers. You know? The man I love. I got all kinds of... But it wasn't one answer. The point is it wasn't one answer. Allah Azza wa Jal made us emotionally monochrome. We're just one way. Overwhelmingly. I mean, there are unique individuals that love books more than they love women. Or, you know, <laughs> there are those... <laughs> How do you do it? How do you do it? Okay. <laughs> but overwhelmingly, He made us one way. And so Allah described it. Now, in my personal opinion, the rewards of women described in Jannah are actually more eloquent. They're more eloquent. I'll share with you an Arabic expression you might be familiar with. Rubba sukutin ablahu min kalamin. Perhaps silence speaks more loudly than speech. Allah Azza wa Jal is silent on this, not to say that there are no rewards, but they're beyond words. And this happens in the Qur'an as a matter of fact. There are rewards for different kinds of deeds, but sometimes there are deeds that are so magnificent to Allah that they can't even be put in words. 
So what does Allah say about those kind of deeds? فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then the compensation of such a deed is on Allah. Allah will take care of it. That's the reward by the way, incidentally, that indescribable reward is for someone who forgives somebody. Even if they have had the power to take revenge and they still forgave, then that person gets a reward that can't even be described. Allah just says, I'll take care of him. It's on Allah. Allah will take care of him. SubhanAllah. Now, for women's rewards not to be described is not to take away, but to actually elaborate, further leave to the imagination. And incidentally, no Muslim believer, man or woman should feel like they're going to be shortchanged. Get to Jannah, you won't be disappointed. What am I going to get though? I don't know if I'll like it. You'll like it. What's the proof you'll like it? Surat Fussilat. Surat Surat number 41. Allah Azza wa says to all of humanity, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ You will have whatever you desire. You'll have, that's open to men and women. Whatever you want will be there. And then some. And then some. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدْعُونَ And whatever you might come across, later might pop in your head. Uh, you place an order for something later on. Oh wait, 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 but I wanted that too. Fine, you can have that too. You can't just, it's not like you already placed the order, it's non-refundable. You're stuck with it. No, 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 you can change your order. You can order something else. Great. That, that door is open to both men and to women. Are you tired of all these annoying ads on YouTube? Are you worried that a haram video might pop up? Well, the One Islam TV app is here to solve these problems, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is 100% free of any ads and is safe to browse for your peace of mind. Watch or listen to lectures and lessons while you work, rest or drive with your device switched off. Watch videos on demand or download videos and watch offline. Watch hundreds of high quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran learning videos, stories of the prophets and so much more. Two to four new videos uploaded daily, inshallah. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means a small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariya, continuous charity for you as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders. Insha'Allah. The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. So you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work.